Thanks for joining us for this look at the best original reporting from KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Coming up, ballots were sent this week to communities holding elections next month. We'll explain the races to decide big issues from North County to the South Bay. In honor of World Mental Health Day, one local school shows us how it's trying to meet the, the needs of their students. And the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance joins a new effort to protect and save vulnerable animal species around the world. And we start at the border where asylum seekers have been held off and on in outside holding areas by the Border Patrol. Gustavo Solis reports on the death of one migrant and why advocates say it was inevitable. We're just profoundly saddened to learn that what we have feared has now happened. Um, we've known that it was a matter of time before someone died. Nina Douglas is one of the volunteers at Customs and Border Protection's open-air migrant camp. She says volunteers have seen migrants with diabetes, heart conditions, and open gashes vulnerable to infection. But we've been told that other than calling an ambulance that Border Patrol is not equipped to treat any condition here. The volunteers provide basic treatment to migrants with donated supplies, bandages, first aid kits, flu medicine, and aspirin from their makeshift pharmacy. Customs and Border Protection issued a statement confirming that a migrant died Wednesday morning. Officials say the person began experiencing medical distress at 5.45 a.m. and was taken to a hospital where they were pronounced dead. Officials did not release the woman's name or say exactly what led to her death. Volunteers say she was from the West African country of Guinea and traveled with relatives. She and her family members went so far to get here and I'm sure suffered a lot and then to get this far for her to die and not have the medical attention she deserved. Um, I trust that the people present did their best. I, w I need to believe that, but that's not good enough. The camp is situated between two border walls near the San Ysidro port of entry. It was first opened in fall 2022 and reopened last month. All along, migrant advocates have warned of the dangerous conditions. We have been telling everybody that will listen um, that the medical emergencies in the open air detentions are, are serious and should be addressed. Flower Alvarez Lopez is another volunteer. She has been at the camp since September 7th. She says some migrants are reluctant to get medical help. That's because it means they will be separated from family. That's what happened earlier this week when a pregnant woman from Russia needed medical attention. Alvarez says the woman could not take her husband and two children to the hospital with her. So she had to pick which one of her children she would be going to the hospital with. She ended up taking her oldest child, who to me seemed about nine years old or so. She says volunteers at the camp are experiencing what she calls secondhand trauma and need more support. The burnout is real and it's unsustainable. We've been here at the border wall and the open air detention sites with um, no support or resources from any level of government. So not from city, not from county, not from the state and uh, not from the federal government. CBP personnel cleared the camp Thursday morning. By the afternoon, all that was left were abandoned toys, sneakers, and trash. Officials say the CBP's Office of Professional Responsibility is reviewing the incident. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. October is recognized as Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There are currently more than 4 million breast cancer survivors in the U.S. KPBS reporter Melissa May tells us how treatment has changed in recent years. Breast cancer is the second most common cancer for women. This is not a pretty pink disease. This is a nasty struggle that a lot of women go through, you know, one in eight. So to me, Breast Cancer Awareness Month means courage and fighting. 13 years ago, Rebecca Dabbs noticed a small lump on her left breast. The then 34-year-old was diagnosed with HER2 positive breast cancer and says at times it was overwhelming. I lost all my hair. Um, I had 12 uh, breast surgeries. I, I lost my left breast. And um, luckily, 
which is not the case for everybody. You know, I had a strong support system to help me through. The American Cancer Society says breast cancer death rates have declined by 43 percent since the late 1980s due to early screenings, increased awareness, and better treatments, thanks to large-scale clinical trials. These clinical trials have shown us that people can have less toxic therapies for early-stage breast cancer. And then on the same token, women are with advanced or metastatic stage 4 breast cancer. Our studies show that women are now living longer. Earlier this year, the United States Preventive Services Task Force changed the recommendation that all women at age 40, not 50, get a breast cancer screening with a mammogram every other year. Dr. Rebecca Shatsky with UC San Diego's Breast Medical Oncology Department says if you notice any breast skin changes, not just lumps, to contact your primary care doctor. If there's new skin thickening or changes to the nipple, sometimes breast tumors can actually pull the nipple into the breast where it wasn't before. And that's called nipple retraction. She says the average age of women being diagnosed with breast cancer is 61. But recently, there has been an increase in younger women being diagnosed. Latina women, there was just a recent article out, are diagnosed with breast cancer on average seven years earlier than their Caucasian counterparts. And we know that African-American women are also more likely to be breast diagnosed with breast cancer in their 40s as opposed to their 50s and 60s. There is a Making Strides Against Breast Cancer walk this Sunday, October 15th at Balboa Park. Go to cancer.org to sign up. Melissa May, KPBS News. Tuesday was World Mental Health Day, and one local school district has a new approach to meet the needs of its students. KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne shows us how it's working in San Marcos. Let's face it together. That is the name of the mental health program all of San Marcos students will have access to. I couldn't be here standing here without you guys. And just to know that you guys genuinely care really, really makes a big difference and impact. And I do hope that the Let's Face It program has millions of impacts out there for other students who also need to hear the story and also needs to face all these mental health problems. Irene Irvin is a high school student who was in a bad mental state. I was worried about being neglected, being rejected, not being able to fit in like the rest of the students were. But then one day something changed. And what that was, was the amazing Mission Hills Grizzlies on our campus and the Let's Face It program. Nurse Ann, Ms. Seagal. Irving goes on to name the counselors and adults on her campus who helped pull her out of a dark spot. All a part of the Let's Face It Together program. We've always had counselors, we've always had social workers, we've always had folks on campus that cared, but this really was gonna draw attention to the fact that mental health is everybody's business. Everybody has been impacted by the pandemic. Nobody was unscathed. Christy Frias is the Director of Student Services for the district. Well, pre-pandemic, people might have thought, ooh, mental health counseling, that's weird, I don't wanna talk about that. There's nobody that can say they didn't have some impact after being home. And so this was a way to kind of do that in a really positive way. And it's not looked down on. There's no shame with it. It's just we're here for you. Colorful posters and signs throughout the campus encourage students to reach out if they need mental health help. Students can access help by texting a number that will respond with confidential resources. There is also a wellness team that addresses more severe cases and goes on to address mental health needs in the student's home. A $2 million grant from the city of San Marcos helped roll out the two-year program. But Fria says it's something they plan on keeping and funding because the investment is saving students' lives. We have saved lives and we can say that confidently and it is almost on a weekly basis where we are having incidents where students are coming forward that maybe previously wouldn't have had the support and now they're getting it. San Marcos students can text 741-741 if they or a friend are looking for mental health support. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. This week also included National Coming Out Day. For one local politician, doing so came with an assist from a major national newspaper. Katie Heisen caught up with Marnie Von Wilpert for her unique coming out story.
you're hoping to have maybe private, quiet conversations with folks. Instead, I came out in the New York Times. <laughs> a reporter interviewed Von Wilpert after anti-LGBTQ plus protesters checked out all the books from a Pride Month display in a library in her district. When the reporter asked me, you know, are you a member of the LGBTQ community? I don't want to hide it. Von Wilpert says the article prompted tough conversations with conservative family members who were supportive in the end. But that's not the case for everyone. Many homeless youth in San Diego are LGBTQ plus children who were evicted by their families. Von Wilpert says she's pushing to open another shelter just for them. Even while she celebrates being out, she says she's watching gay rights be taken back. This summer alone, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that businesses can refuse some services to LGBTQ plus people. Grossmont Union School District ended a contract with a suicide prevention nonprofit that also assists LGBTQ plus youth. And the Temecula Board of Education tried to remove Harvey Milk, a gay civil rights leader and politician, from its curriculum. I'm not sure what my future looks like sometimes in this country, uh, which is something I never thought I'd say. Even still, she says, coming out was worth it. It's less isolating to be able to come out and, and to, to be free. Um, and as someone who, who is a very public figure, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to just be who I am. To everyone else who came out this year or will come out today, she says, congratulations. Katie Heisen, KBBS News. There are many ways to find KPBS content, and one of them is through our podcasts, daily and weekly radio shows like Midday Edition Roundtable are available for streaming anytime. We also have our daily news roundup, San Diego News Now, along with digital first series like Freeway Exit. Just search for KPBS on all major streaming platforms. Our story on Marnie Von Wilpert was one of our most read this week at kpbs.org. Here are some of the others. Regulators cast more clouds over California's solar energy market. KPBS meets some of the hundreds of students who live in the U.S. but go to college in Tijuana. And we take a trip to Pacific Beach, where San Diego Unified is breaking ground on a new modernized elementary school. Nearly 600,000 ballots are arriving in the mailboxes of registered voters. Depending on where you live, you may be one of them. The KPBS Voter Hub is back this year in English and in Spanish to guide people through four local special elections happening November 7th. We have explainers for each race. Let's start with Alexander Wynn and the water divorces happening in the North County. Three opposed, the motion passes. In July, the Local Agency Formation Commission, or LAFCO, approved the divorce. It's the agency overseeing disputes like this. Detachment is a two-step process. Now voters in Rainbow and Fallbrook will have their say in November's special election. Like any divorce, the problem started brewing years ago. The Water Authority started making improvements to water reliability about 30 years ago. These two agencies now just want to skip out and leave the rest of us footing the bill. And like any infrastructure projects, there were costs. The projects raised water rates for everyone. Mel Katz is the chair of the Water Authority. We invested millions and millions of dollars so that we, when we have the drought that just finished, and is going to come back, we were not affected here in San Diego County because we had plenty of water. But for residents and farmers in Rainbow and Fallbrook, the costs were too much and they say they weren't benefiting from the projects. Nick Kernich is a farmer in Fallbrook. I'm really hoping this will open up an opportunity for uh, farmers to actually get fair water rates and um, get the relief that we need. According to a LAFCO analysis, Rainbow and Fallbrook residents could save an estimated $7.7 .7 million a year by leaving. If residents vote yes to leave, they will still need to pay an exit fee of roughly $25 million over the next five years. Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. The winner of the city attorney election will become Chula Vista's top lawyer. They'll give legal advice to the mayor, council, and every city department. It's a very important job. So says former city council member Rudy Ramirez. Do you want somebody who's apolitical and somebody who could just focus on the law? So who are the candidates? Dan Smith Diaz was a federal public defender who owned a pedicab company in San Diego and then opened his own law firm in Chula Vista. I started at Federal Defenders, so I know how to litigate. I have been a litigator for 
the my entire career. And that means going to court and actually trying jury trial cases and winning them. Marco Verdugo started his career as an intern in the Chula Vista City Attorney's Office. He's also worked for the San Diego City Attorney's Office and now works for a private law firm advising the cities of Coronado and Solana Beach. So I know what issues big cities face and the issues that smaller cities face. And, and um, I'm prepared to, to handle anything that Chula Vista is facing in, in the um, coming years. The third candidate, Bart Meisfeld, responded after our broadcast deadline. His comments can be found on the KPBS website. Gustavo Solis, KPBS News. Hey, San Diego, you may have heard there's a special election happening next month. Voters will be choosing a new county supervisor for District 4, which includes parts of central San Diego, as well as La Mesa, Lemon Grove, and Spring Valley. County supervisors can sometimes be less well-known than, say, mayors or city council members, but their job is no less important. The supervisors approve the county budget, which is more than $8 billion, and includes programs like food stamps, Medi-Cal, and the public health department. County supervisors are also the local government for the unincorporated areas, the communities outside of city limits. The supervisors decide things like which county roads need repaving and where to plan for future growth. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. <laughs> Three years ago, Democrats gained a majority on the Board of Supervisors for the first time in a generation. They've passed progressive reforms on issues ranging from cannabis to climate change. Then, former Supervisor Nathan Fletcher was accused of sexual harassment. He resigned, and now the board is split evenly 2-2. The election on November 7th is a runoff between San Diego City Council member Monica Montgomery Stepp and private investigator Amy Reichert. Reichert is a Republican, Montgomery Stepp is a Democrat, but you won't see their party affiliation on the ballot because officially the office is nonpartisan. You can learn more about the candidates and how to vote by going to kpbs.org slash voter hub. This month, the COVID payment pause on student loans ended and repayments restarted. Americans owe $1.7 trillion in student loan debt. Behind every dollar is someone's story of survival and sacrifice. KPBS education reporter M.G. Perez has more on the price of payback. Between the time I got these degrees and actually was able to put some of that knowledge and stuff to work, I got cancer. 73-year-old Cindy Nelson is a breast cancer survivor. She also survived more than $100,000 in student loan debt, much of it mounting interest. I was blessed that I even had the opportunity to go to college, no matter what it took. It took a lot because in her late 30s, Nelson became a single mother with two children to support after a divorce, triggered by her coming out as a lesbian. Her truth brought her freedom and financial responsibilities. Going to college, she hoped, would eventually provide security for her family. You gotta go to college to have the world open up to you. You'll be with people that you never imagined. You'll You'll see diversity like you've never seen. Grant money helped pay for a portion of her bachelor's degree in visual arts from UC San Diego. But it was federal loans that paid for a master's degree in education from San Diego State in 1997 and on to a successful job at the SDSU School of Nursing, which came with lifetime health benefits and a steady income when she needed to pay back her loan. When times were rough, they would put me on income contingent to pay as I go. And then if, when things got better, I would pay more and whatever. But once I got um, the cancer and couldn't work, I just stopped paying them. Cindy's story is like so many other stories of student borrowers who found themselves drowning in debt when life happened. There are millions of borrowers who are hoping for relief and loan forgiveness. Dan Ricotto is a clinical professor of finance at the University of San Diego with 20 years of investment banking experience. He says loan forgiveness has to come with reform. Recognize that we do have to provide relief to certain borrowers who simply are never going to be able to pay this back. And at the same time, recognize that we have to tie the ribbon a little tighter between the value of a college education and how we pay for that college education. 
I started paying it back right away. Tim Barunas had to pay off $200,000 in student loans for his medical school education. I'm fortunate in the sense that I, I make a physician level salary and you know I, I was able to make those payments. Consistent payments that included a few lump sums helped Barunas get his total down to $50,000. It did not help him find happiness, practicing family medicine with 60-hour work weeks. This is uh, Odessa. She's six. And this is Simon. It's an, it's an older picture, but he's 10. Barunas left medicine for a remote job working from home as a medical procedure consultant, giving him more time to spend with his family. He also discovered a Biden administration program that gave him credit for consistent payments and his work at nonprofit hospitals, eliminating his remaining balance. Being able to then take advantage of this program, which I was sort of intended to qualify for, I think, I feel really good about having been able to take advantage of that and, uh, yeah, not having those loans anymore. Cindy Nelson also discovered a forgiveness plan based on her limited income and repayment history, and she is now student loan debt-free and cancer-free. When I lost everything, it was tough. But I made it through. And the finance expert Dan Ricardo says there is hope for anyone who wants it. It's become a center stage issue. And that's important. It's no longer the, sort of this fringe issue that, you know, the guys in the Ivy Towers on campus will figure out. M.G. Perez, KPBS News. An easily accessible bathroom isn't always a given at one high school in Chula Vista. KPBS South Bay reporter Corey Suzuki explains why the school is closing restrooms and the effect that is having on students. For Petra Dudon, freshman year at Chula Vista High is off to a stressful start. There's all the new people, the classwork, and then there's the bathroom situation. There's like a certain bathrooms right there, but those bathrooms are closed due to baby. So I have to go to like the nearest bathrooms where I'm five minutes away. And like the teacher like, doesn't let you go out again. In recent weeks, most of the bathrooms have been closed at the 2500 student school. On Tuesday, she had to walk five minutes from her Spanish class to find one that was open. Chula Vista High and several other schools in Sweetwater Union High School District have been closing bathrooms in response to a spike in vaping, vandalism, and other bad behaviors by some students. But all students have been impacted. Here's student representative Isaiah Ringfield speaking at the Sweetwater board meeting last month. Um, multiple campuses um, have had one bathroom open um, on the entire campus to help with what they've heard is that it's to help with vaping in bathrooms, um, violence, like I said. Um, but one bathroom open throughout the entire campus is huge. Um, when you're talking about 2,000 plus students on campuses. Chula Vista High Principal Julio Alcala says he doesn't remember a time when the school has only had one or two bathrooms open. But he says they do close bathrooms when they find out someone has been vaping. We reached him on Wednesday, College Spirit Day at the school. We've seen, unfortunately, in more recent times, an increase in uh, students vaping in restrooms. Um, and that is a concern uh, for us. And that is, uh, you know, what we see uh, more frequently and uh, we end up closing the restrooms um, until we can, you know, investigate, um, you know, if we can see who was there vaping. Some other schools across the county have also been restricting access to bathrooms, including Patrick Henry High School and Lincoln High School and San Diego Unified School District. But bathroom closures don't appear to be as big of an issue on those campuses, according to parents. Closing so many bathrooms in Sweetwater might even violate state law which requires all California schools to have at least one bathroom for every 40 students. Some campuses have recently started to open up more facilities after students brought this up to the school board. And many Chula Vista High students are glad to hear it. Petra says high school is already complicated enough as it is. It's like too much people to work. Like you miss one assignment, go down to an F and like it's just hard. The bathrooms, she said, are just another thing to worry about. Kori Suzuki, KPBS News. The San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance is joining a worldwide effort to preserve animal diversity. KPBS environment reporter Eric Anderson says the zoo is focusing energy on storing genetic material from critical species. 
the black-footed ferret clone is in here. Marlis Houck is curator of the frozen zoo. So each of these boxes holds 100 vials. And I'll just pull out one box. The supercooled stainless steel tanks preserve cells from more than 10,000 animals, easily eclipsing the number of live animals living at the zoo and safari park. It was one frozen sample of a Chevalsky's horse that led to the cloning of Kurt. Scientists hope that wild horse will reintroduce much needed genetic diversity to the endangered population. It's huge because it shows that, that the technology works, that we can actually re recreate animals from the frozen zoo. So the cells in the frozen zoo that's what, the, that's what the purpose is, is to maintain genetic diversity. The animal samples and a growing collection of seeds and frozen plants are part of the new Center for Species Survival, Biodiversity Banking in San Diego. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature says these efforts have an important role to play and actions need to be coordinated and strategic. Whether we're talking about saving species through cryopreservation in biobanking, managing populations that are living in human care, or out in the field working in situ. We all need to be working together, whether we're a government, an NGO, a zoo aquarium or botanic garden expert, or a scientist out there on the ground in the field. The group says the rate of extinction is alarming, claiming nearly three species an hour. The San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance's Paul Barabalt says the partnership with the international group is special. We talk a lot about conservation at its heart, starting with people. And it has to start with people so that it can grow, build alliances, build partnerships around the globe so we can achieve more together. The Alliance's frozen zoo is the largest and most diverse collection of its kind. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. And a reminder, you can find our stories and a lot more on the KPBS YouTube page. Subscribe and get notified when new content is posted. That's also where we live stream KPBS Evening Edition weeknights at 5. We hope you enjoyed this look at KPBS News this week. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Thanks for joining us.